Jalissa Hunter. Good evening, thank you for coming to testify. Good evening, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Jalisa Hunter. I'm a United States Army veteran. I served my entire, my entire contract stationed overseas away from my family and friends. I moved to New York City after completing my enlistment with the goals of earning a higher education to give myself a better life. Um, of my battle buddies that I met overseas while serving, four others moved to New York City with me. One is forced to live with family because he can't afford to live on his own. One is living check to check, honestly unable to support herself comfortably with where her rent is right now. And one got here and was homeless and unfortunately was forced into a shelter so that she could get government assistance to help her with her rent. Um, I got here and was faced with an apartment that was riddled with roaches and other pests, a kitchen that hasn't been updated in at least 25 years, and windows that were literally covered with ice. You couldn't open the windows at all. They were frozen shut in the wintertime because the temperatures in, in my bedrooms were so cold. Um, this was, this was what I could afford at the time, and it cost me upwards of $8,000 to move into an apartment that really should have been condemned. Um, I couldn't use my kitchen at all for the first three months that I got here. No types of concessions were offered to me at all. Um, if the rent increases, I have no idea what type of options would be available for me at that point. So please consider myself and other veterans like me and really all, all, all citizens of New York City um, because if the rent increases, not only will we not be able to have a place to stay, but we might be forced with the, the question of are you gonna pay your rent or are you gonna feed yourself for the month? New York is supposed to be the city of dreams, but this housing crisis has turned all of our lives into a nightmare. So, thank you. Thank you. Emily Hirsch. Uh, good evening. My good name evening. Is Emily thank Hirsch. you for coming in. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Emily Hirsch, and I have lived in a rent stabilized um, unit in Inwood for my entire life. Um, I'm a member of Met Council on Housing, and also Northern Manhattan is not for sale. Inwood and Northern Manhattan as a whole have one of the highest number of rent stabilized units in the entire city, and I urge you to vote on a rent freeze to protect these units and the people who live in them. Beyond the affordability of these units being threatened by landlord harassment, MCIs, and vacancy bonuses, Inwood is facing a city-proposed rezoning, which will bring in a, a tremendous number of market rate units, providing further incentives for landlords to evict working class immigrant tenants. I ask you all to take a moment to think about all of the rent-stabilized and rent-burdened tenants who cannot be here tonight. Each one of us who is testifying is representing hundreds, if not thousands, of people who cannot make it here. Now, more than ever, we need a rent freeze for the two and a half million rent stabilized tenants in New York. As Rent Guidelines Board members, you have the fate of working class New Yorkers in your hands. Please vote on the side of justice and vote for a rent freeze. Thank you. Nova Lucero. Okay. I, draw you, I drew you guys this so that you can remember. I want the owner members to just remember where the, the landlords are getting their money. When they say that landlords don't get money, they get money from the buyouts, from all the money that they get from getting the um, tenants out who have been living there for you know, 40, 50 plus years. They get money from denying succession rights of tenants. They get money from cheap and shoddy repairs, from not doing any repairs, from vacancy bonuses, from rent overcharges, legal and illegal rent overcharges, from MCIs, IAIs. They must have a lot of money too because they are lobbying constantly, Albany, 
and our rent laws are the weakest because of that. We have, in addition to that, um, there I spent some time as a case manager and a housing specialist in the South Bronx with the organization Bronx Works and Home Base. And I went to a couple of slumlord buildings in the South Bronx where the landlords were making a lot of money from not having to pay for a super. They were getting all the undocumented people to serve as the people making the repairs in very dangerous conditions because they were not well-maintained buildings. They were not doing repairs um, it sufficiently enough because, hello, they were in dangerous conditions. Um, so one, they're making a lot of money. Two, I want to just stress the sense of urgency right now that you all are making this decision. Yes, you did a rent freeze a couple of years ago, and that helped tremendously. But right now, we are facing rezoning after rezoning, development of luxury housing after development of luxury housing, fake affordable housing developments after fake affordable housing developments. There is a lot of money that is already in real estate. There is not a question. You cannot question all of the money that they are making. I want to also just stress, my family has moved five times out of the six, past six years from preferential rent apartment to preferential rent apartment because that is the only type of apartment that they can find. The rent increases over the past 15, 20, 30 years have made this, this um, um, real estate market just really hard to find an apartment. And I want to just add one other thing. A lot of people have been saying that because we have programs like Section 8 and we have programs like all the link and, you know, all the problems that the mayor de Blasio is making up as he goes right now, that there, that's enough to keep people, you know, to get apart apartments right now. That's not true. That's why we have a long list of people get, waiting to get into shelter. That's why we have a lot of people who are street homeless, who are doubled up in apartments. I don't understand how we can really think about this housing situation when we know that we get on trains, that we know when we walk past parks, when we go into our buildings, we see people who are homeless in our lobbies. Excuse me, you, you, Hillary, you I want you to up. listen to this because you have a responsibility as a public member to really put the personal story that these owners want you to forget. I really want you guys to think about this very carefully. A 0.75 increase is too much of an increase. We don't deserve any of that. The owners already have enough Thank you. Thank you. The next three speakers are Ellen Flowers, Catherine Nixon, and Carmen Guzman Lombard. Good evening. Thank you for coming in to testify. Good evening. Um, this is the last appeal. I'm so glad I'm here. Um, for to please, just to let you guys hear our cries. Please, please, please help save New York City. Look at what's happening in California. I'm sure you guys know the situation in California. Well, New York is going down that path. Okay, we don't want 10 cities in New York City, like what's happening in California. Please, help us. Help us. There's, most people have nowhere to go. I know I have nowhere to go, but a shelter, and the shelters are turning people away. The shelters are turning family and children away, single people. They tell people, you know, you know, if they're from other states, they give them bus tickets to go back to where they came from. So, I mean, what are we going to do down the line? We need to do something now, because if we don't, it's going to get worse in the future. We're going to have tent cities. People are going to be pitching tents in the streets, like California. That's what's happening in California. We know that. We don't want that here in New York City, please. Help us. I don't know what we're going to do, to tell you the truth. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. What, what, well, where are we going to live? Where are we going to go? Where are people going to go? Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank Have you. Catherine Nixon.
Okay. Do you prefer to sit down? We can bring the mic to you. My name is Catherine with a K, Nixon, N-I-C-H-S-O-N. This is a surprise to me that I am here because I was on the avenue and I saw Met Council group coming toward this way. So I said to myself, I think I must go and say something. I was, I was, I, I, we had a branch in, ha in Harlem, or Met Council on Housing. I'm going to tell you my date of birth. My date of birth is 9920. Figure it out. I'm 97 years old. I am very uh, ashamed of the government. When I say ashamed, this veteran that just got up and spoke, I am a veteran. I am a World War I baby. My father fought in World War I, and he was recognized more over in France than they were here. They were called the Harlem Hellfighters. And my father, when he came home, I was born. So that's why I call myself a World War I baby. My father died when I was three years old. And that's when the real war began. Because the government did not see fit to give my mother enough money or on time to pay the rent. So we were dispossessed. They had no such thing as a housing court. Our belongings were put out on the street and people were picking over them. And every month in the year, I would move. Every month now, but by the grace of God, with God looking over us and a good family, we survived. My brother, my two brothers, they were in the army. But I want to say, this is deplorable that the government would let the soldiers have to fight to, to, to pay their rent. That's a disgrace on the federal government. And I intend to sue the federal government because of the way they have treated our veterans. And I sent a letter to Michelle Obama thanking her for her concern about the veterans. And, and nobody thought I would receive a letter from her, but I did, and I traded that letter. But all I want to do is tell y'all to do the right things for the people, the people, the children, the seniors, everybody. We, we desire, we desire some recognition. Think, think, would you want your mother or your father pleading for a place to live or a place to have fun? What, what is going on? America is in a crisis. It needs to take care of its people today and forever. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Do the right thing. The next speaker is Carmen Guzman Lambert. She dropped the mic. I don't think I can follow that. Okay. Actually, I'm not really from Casa. I'm wearing their shirt. I'm from Hell's Kitchen. Uh -huh. My Good landlord evening. is Steve Croman, who's in jail. And I'm wearing red shoes. I am wearing red shoes because there's no place like home. So, I want to give you an image from a movie. Think of when the bandits want to get the money that's in the stagecoach, and they shoot the guy that's driving the horses, and there are travelers inside the stagecoach, and you can see from the long shot, there's the cliff. That's where we are at that place in the movie. 
I have lived in my apartment building for 26 years, and three years ago, Steve Croman bought the building. I have lived in Hell's Kitchen for about 40 years, when I came from the Dominican Republic. You don't want to live in the third world. I lived in the third world. I was born in the third world. It's not a place where um, artistry can happen, where people can be creative and put all of their best effort forward. If you remember Maslow's theory of hierarchy, at the bottom of the triangle, food and shelter. There's a reason for that. Also, I signed a social contract. I raised children despite the fact that I'm a DV survivor. I don't know who mentioned that. And also, I was diagnosed with mental illness after the birth of my second daughter. My children are paying taxes. They are 26 and 27 now. The people that seem like problems today are really your resources. So please, Safeguard these housing units. I am no longer at a place where I need to worry because I, like I said my daughters are working. I plan to go back into the workforce. I want to be a filmmaker. But there are people who are the people who were here when we had the white flight out of our neighborhoods and who stayed. And they deserve a place, a decent place to live. Thank you. Thank you. The next three speakers are Ava Farkas. Misa Dason and Abby Coons. Good evening. Thank Good you for coming to testify. So, um, I find this whole hearing process somewhat ridiculous and demeaning. Um, I think it's demeaning that tenants have to come and like spill their personal stories and details of their life and like beg you guys <laughs> to have mercy on them. Um, and I wish it was reversed. I wish that we were debating a red freeze and landlords had to come here and justify why they can't afford a rent freeze or a rent rollback. Um, I think it's really unfair that the burden is on working class people who have important things to do with their time to come here and really, um, you know, grovel. Um, and I think that a really important question is like how much profit the landlords need to make. So we know they're making 41.7% profit. Um, that's a lot of profit. That's above paying for all their expenses. You guys, uh, I mean, the system guarantees them 5% profit. If they make less than that, then they're exempt from the rent increases. So 5% compared to like 41.7%, that's a huge difference. How much do you think they should make? What other industry is making that much profit? Even during the rent freeze, they made profit. So I think really like the question needs to be reversed, not like how much can regular New Yorkers shoulder, but how much is like the right amount of profit? Like that's ultimately what you guys are deciding is how much profit should landlords make? And I think everybody knows that landlords are doing fine. It's one of the most profitable industries. So, um, I mean, the last thing I just wanted to say is that I went to my high school reunion, my 20 year high school reunion. I went to LaGuardia High School. I grew up in New York City. None of my classmates live in New York City anymore. Many of their families that lived on the Upper West Side were kicked out, harassed by their landlords, dragged through like years of court and like stress and trauma. Um, you know, I don't think I need to say to any of you that New York is like quickly, quickly changing. Like it's really serious and the future of the city really rests on your shoulders. You guys have a really big job to do and a really important role in that. So I just really hope that you guys think about like not just us, but like the landlords. Like what do they need to make and why? Thanks. Thank you. Misa Dason.
Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for coming to testify. Thank you. My name is Misa Dason, and I'm a tenant of Lenox Terrace here in Harlem, and I've lived in Lenox Terrace for my entire life. I'm here to demand a rent fees for three reasons. First, two months ago, a New York Times article reported that market rate rents in the city have decreased since last year by 6.3% in Brooklyn and 3.8% in Manhattan. Uh, so if market rates have gone down by that much in just one year, why would the Rent Guidelines Board prey on tenants who can't afford market rate rents by raising rent-stabilized rents in order to help landlords make up the difference in their income? That doesn't make sense. If market rates are going down, rent-stabilized rents shouldn't be going up. Second, the only reason why I'm able to still live in this city is because I live in a rent-stabilized apartment. I have $45,000 in educational loans, and after taxes, my take-home pay is $41,000. And amongst my social network of friends living in Harlem, also in rent-stabilized units, I'm considered lucky because they are shouldering loans of $90,000 to $100,000 because we all had to take them to pay for our undergraduate, our grads, our medical and law degrees. Um, we have these high educational debts because many of us also wanted to give back to the city and be of service. So they work in public hospitals, we work as educational workers, and we work in the arts. We are the reason why we contribute to the lifeblood of New York, which is the reason why tourists come here every year, because we give New York its global reputation. So if my rent goes up, I'm further stressed, and I'm further squeezed and even trying to pay aggressively my educational loans, and I can't even really live in the city after a while. Secondly, lastly, landlords last year's net operating income went up 10.8% last year, and I'm here to tell you that that money, that surplus money, is not going back into my building of Lenox Terrace. The first two months of this year, all three elevators in our building were only working 11% of the time. Every month after that, we've always had at least one elevator go down every other week. Last week on Tuesday, all three elevators were broke for at least three, two hours, making it difficult for the disabled and elderly. They couldn't even get to their apartments. And thank God, nobody had a medical emergency because medical personnel would, not, would have had to go upstairs. And we were in a 17th floor building. The repairman of the elevators said to one of our tenants that he has repeatedly, and their company has repeatedly told Lennox Terrace that all three elevators that were installed in 1955 need to be completely replaced because Excuse they're old. Me. I'm almost done. This is just one example of the willful neglect of our landlords of not upkeeping our building that is literally, literally putting the health and safety of our tenants at risk. As tenants, we are constantly fighting such neglect as well as getting our basic living needs met. And the last thing we need right now is to deal with the added financial stress of paying our rent. So I need the Rent Guidelines Board to vote for a rent freeze to help the people who make this city what it is. We are the ones who make the city what it is. And we want to stay here. But in order to stay here, we need to be able to afford here. And so you need to freeze our rents. Thank, Thank you. you. Abby Coons. Hi. Good evening. Hi. Thank you for coming in. Good evening to the chair and board. My name is Abby Coons, and I'm part of the Met Council on Housing. Many of my family members are or have been renters in New York City. Um, and I'm going to be brief right now. In New York City, the homeless crisis has reached a breaking point. There are officially 62,498 homeless people in New York City, and if rent increases, there is no doubt that so will this deeply vulnerable population. There is no way around it. If you don't support a rent freeze, you will have blood on your hands. If you have any desire at all to stop making New York City a playground for the rich, you must freeze rents now. Tenants should not have to relive their trauma for you to understand it. Thank you. I just want to remind you that if there's anyone here who wants to speak this evening, you, d you need to sign up by 8 o'clock with the RGB staff at the entrance to the hall. And we need to get the interpretation of this uh, announcement. Thank you. Se les recuerda a todos que si desean hablar esta noche, eh, brindar testimonio, tienen hasta las 8 de la noche hoy para apuntarse con el personal que se encuentra allá en la mesa de recepción. Muchas gracias. The next three speakers are Fred Newton, 
Jean Ruskin, and Madison Delaney. Well, hello, good evening to all. My name is Fred Newton. I'm a retired city employee of seven years. Uh, I've heard everything everybody said earlier. Lots of things have been said about MCIs and vacancy, uh, vacancy, you know, bonuses, lack of repairs. Um, the eight people in front of us, in front of me, are one component of, of a very large, I think, quite evil system. Um, Before the Trump Mueller, before the Mueller investigation, I was very aware of all the money that foreigners invest in real estate. It is a haven for quote the Russian mafia, the Russian oligarchs, drug dealers, all the former customers of BCCI. If you remember that banking scandal. Um, <clears throat> You have no say over things like uh, MCIs, or you only have say over rent. But this system has so many components. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe landlords do get t tax credits for warehousing. Um, sorry if I upset any vegans and, or vegetarians, but it's very depressing to me that four or five of my favorite hamburger joints have bit the dust. Um, but the, the task that you are in, the task that you were entrusted to do, you can do the right things. And as the woman who spoke before me put it, if you don't, you have blood on your hands. And even if you want to be charitable, you're going to have to look at yourself in the mirror sooner or later. Um, what would really be fair and equitable and just would be, say, a two percent rollback for for one year leases. And a 1% or 0.5% roll back for two year, for, for a one year lease. I was at a um, political club meeting and my city councilwoman, Carolyn Maloney, spoke. She said they cannot figure out who all these owners are because of the LLCs. At a former meeting, a former meeting my state senator, Liz Kruger, said it is easier for uh, dirty money, which I described before, to invest in real estate than it is to open a bank account. When she said that, I almost flipped out and went crazy. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Jean Ruskin. Good evening. Thank you for coming to testify. Good evening. Thank you for hearing so many of our voices. My name is Jeannie Ruskin. I have lived in Inwood for 37 years in a rent-stabilized apartment. I'm a senior. I'm on a fixed income. I don't think I have a story that would add one thing to the many heartfelt things that have been said tonight. I just want to say you're obviously intelligent and caring people who can connect the many dots that are on the table before you. You know that instability of housing creates Stress that destroys lives, destroys relationships, families, communities, neighborhoods, cities, and countries. And I urge you, I beseech you, to vote your consciences. Thank you. Thank you. Madison Delaney. Good evening, thank you for coming to testify. Thank you for hearing us. I just, I really hope that after everyone has spoken today that you've really listened to everyone who's spoken to you. My name is Madison Delaney, like you said, and I'm a resident of Manhattan. New York City has long claimed to be a place of opportunity and a place of promise for anyone. It's a place where anyone can come to find a new community, to find a better life, to make a life for themselves and their family, and at the basis of this opportunity is the availability of affordable housing for anyone who comes here. To consider a rent increase is to revoke this opportunity from millions of New Yorkers. 
to consider any rent increase is to turn your backs on the residents of New York who work every day to keep the city running. To consider any rent increase is to burden and punish these same people and to give a free pass to the few, to the landlords who are trying month after month to run this city. I think it's only fair to tell you that after this, I'm going to be going to my aunt's house. My aunt has three kids and she works a full-time job and additionally, since her most recent lease, has had to start working night shifts in addition. And so twice a week, I put her kids to bed for her. Something that she would really, really love to do every night. So, I would like to urge you, and I would like to demand that you vote for the rent freeze in the coming election. To consider any increase is to tear apart these communities and to further create a divide between the many, the majority of New Yorkers, everyone here before you, and the few landlords who want just a few more dollars to put towards something fancy so that my aunt can't put her own kids to bed. Thank you. Thank you. The next three speakers are Dennis Osorio, Thomasine Holloway, and Pat Sr. Good evening. Good evening. Thank uh, you for coming to testify. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Dennis Osorio. I've been living in East Harlem on 116th Street for a little over eight, uh, eight years now. Uh, when I hear that something like uh, 55 to 60 percent of New Yorkers are considered rent burdened, uh, I believe that an increase in rent is highly irresponsible. It means that there is a serious mismatch between wages and housing. Is it right for seniors or low-income people or families with young children to pay 30 to 50% of their incomes on rent? Let me ask you, what other business makes 42% profit? What other business gets away with laundering money on behalf of the anonymous global rich? What other business shovels the amount of money into our land from our landlords um, to our city and state politicians? What other industry could get us all here in this room, in this hot space, with no water? Let me ask you, how much profit, like Ava said, is too much? And at what cost to everyday people? When investors advertise, they brag about returning 10% uh, of their investment to investors. Yet the real estate industry makes 42% profit. It's incredible. And yet they think that's not enough. Do we need more people to be um, homeless as a sacrifice to this very profitable industry? How many seniors should the city sacrifice? How many families should the city sacrifice to subsidize the real estate industry? How much pain should we inflict so that anonymous LLCs can make more and share less? I demand, we demand a rent freeze. Thank you. Thank you. Thomasine Holloway. Good evening. Good evening. Thank My you for coming Kristen in. Holloway. I'm a retired New York City teacher, and I'm a tenant of the Lenin and I'm a tenant of the Lenox Terrace Development. My landlord is the Lenox Terrace Development Corporation, and I've lived there for over 25 years. Almost every year, every two years, because I signed two-year leases, my rent grows up. Uh, since I have been in this apartment, my rent has more than doubled in less than 20 years between MCIs and other improvements. My pension, and I do receive a New York City pension, 
The COLA for which is one half of 1% per year. That's the cost of living that 30 year New York City teachers get annually. So if your pension was $100,000, you're getting $200 a year, right, as a COLA. There is no way people who are retired from New York City can continue to live in New York City without a rent freeze. I, I don't understand what it is that we're getting from the landlord that warrants an increase. My building, 10, two years ago, had no gas for six months, and there was no rebate of any kind, either from the housing authority or the landlord. I think that's outrageous. And the reason there was no gas was the landlord was slick. They moved the gas lines without notifying Con Ed or discussing it. And when Con Ed came in to find the leak, they couldn't find the leak. So they shut the entire building, all 270 apartments down, many of them for six months. The gas was turned off by Con Ed on the 6th of January, 2016, and my gas did not go on again until the middle of June. No compensation, but well, the landlord deserves an increase. Why? He's not maintaining basic services. My water is very often brown. And I know it's not dangerous, but I don't want brown water for coffee. I don't want to start my coffee with brown water. He needs to clean the pipes. He needs to clean the tank. He needs to maintain services. Uh, our landlords are not doing their fair share. Thank you. Thank Zero you. Zero rent increase. Pat Sr. Good evening. Thank you for coming in to testify. Thank you. Uh, good evening to the Hanover Chair and to the rest of the Rent Stabilized. Uh, Rent Guidelines Board. My name is Pat Senior. I lived in an apartment building in Brooklyn at the address 191 Willoughby Street, apartment 16B, a place where they call University Towers, which was, I believe, illegally converted to a co-op. As a rent stabilized tenant, I did not purchase my apartment because the fees would be more than my rent that I was paying. But the alleged landlord, who I've never met, Michael Rothenberg, used one of his men, who I believe is a gang, um, Bruce Frankenberg, uh, uh, um, one of those uh, eviction people uh, from Queens. He came into my apartment using his badge and a homemade warrant. He evicted me from my home, stole my apartment, and everything that I have worked for. I have been out of my apartment now for 13 years, four months, and 24 days. None of these individuals have been arrested. None of them were prosecuted by Charles Hines, the DA then, nor by DA Morgenthal, who was the DA here in Manhattan, although I have filed multiple complaints there. I have gone to court. All of my cases taken off the court by clerks who be believe that they were judges. And I have been left homeless all these years and have been moved from place to place to place. And whoever gave me lodging, they are being terrorized by this gang, and then I have to move. I have slept on the trains many nights as a woman, there are so many homeless people living on the train, you'd be shocked. Um, the elderly in the apartment building, are take, their apartments are taken away and they're sent to home, um, nursing homes. I have a few of the tenants who I knew, some have died, so they are not able to testify. But thank God I'm alive and I can testify. I've been denied a trial and this is a murder. I have no due process. Michael Rothenberg lives right here in Manhattan, Lower Manhattan, and he has family members who are judges in the court, the landlord tenant court, and in the Supreme Court. I filed complaints, I filed my uh, case in the federal court, 
he was taken off by um by the calendar by a clerk there where he is i don't know none not even one of these people have been ever prosecuted and who and i'm left homeless and this is a part of the homeless scam that they have and the eviction scam that they have using these um people who they call um bruce frankenberg is one of them excuse me your your time is up and we have quite a few more speakers I wish that you all could do something and refer a lot of these cases to support someone to prosecute them other than the existing DA. Because the now DA Eric Gonzalez have covered up my complaint and been denied entry to the DA's office. And this is supposed to be uh, the United States of America. I'm a citizen who paid taxes all my life and worked all my life, yet I have no rights. Thank you. The next three speakers are Coloma Cardwell, Reyes Ramos, and Jules Hollander. Good evening. Good Thank evening. you for coming in to testify. My name is Coloma Cardwell. I am a resident here in Harlem. I'm also a lawyer affiliated with the Metropolitan Black Bar Association and also uh, New York City Bar Association. And I simply want to ask you to not lie to yourselves as you're conducting the analysis and to not lie to us when you communicate what that decision is and how you reach that decision. And I say that because in the law and in these conversations, there are often so many elements that are fundamentally dishonest and I say that because they often like to present this scenario as if we simply have one side making an argument and another side making an argument. And the decision makers pretend that they're simply going to figure out who made the best argument. Or they pretend that, hey, this is just a matter of reading the, the statute and interpreting it. But if you listen to the stories that you've heard today, I mean, people are communicating gross injustices that have been in place for decades, which tells you that there's a history to how we've arrived at this moment. There are power imbalances that have created this moment. And I ask that you include that in your analysis, because it's not just one side is making an argument and you pick the middle ground, or you pick who's made the best argument. Because we're, we're not just here uh, for the reasons that are often put before us, such as the market. Whatever you decide, don't tell us that the market was the driving force. Because the driving force behind all the stories that you heard today are people who are buying politicians, it's people who's buying policy, it's people who have made a determination on the value of the lives of the people in this room. That's why we're, we're having the conversation that we're, ha we're having now. So I simply ask, and I know that my time is up, that you factor that into your analysis and you factor that into how you communicate what your decision is to us. I have just one more thing that, I, that I'm, I'm forgetting in this moment. It doesn't matter, that's, that's it. Um, there's a history, there's a power imbalance, there's a, a gross misplacement on the value of the lives of the people in this room and I ask that you factor that into your analysis. Thank you. Thank you. Grace Ramos. This speaker needs interpretation, please. Good evening. Thank you for coming in. Good evening, my name is Raisa Ramos. I'm part of the Tenants Association in my building. I live at, in our, my building, the number is 139. And I really ask you to intervene in this situation that we're in right now. 
la renta sube, sube y sube. Rent continues to go higher and higher. Uh, yo le pido a ustedes que intervengan a través de esta situación porque me pongo yo de ejemplo como madre soltera, cómo saco mis hijos adelante si tengo dos teenagers que están en la universidad y no puedo con la situación porque la renta es sumamente alta donde vivo. So um, I really ask you to uh, do something about this situation. I'll use, my, uh, I'll use myself as an example. I'm a single mother. I have two teenagers. And how are they going to um, go to university? How am I going to make that happen if the rent continues to go up? Los landos no nos arreglan. Es el, el, la, el propósito de ellos es que nosotros no sigamos con, con esos apartamentos. El propósito de ellos es que estemos afuera de una manera u otra. So the landlords don't fix anything. They uh, just want to, what they really want is for us to leave and for us to get out of there in one way, shape, or form or another. De la única manera que nosotros hemos tenido algo en la asociación de tena de mi building es haciendo huelga de renta. Ya hemos hecho dos huelgas y nuestro building está, no se puede decir, si aquí elaboramos un plan de todo lo que no hace falta, no terminamos hoy. So what we've been able to do with our tenant association is that we've withheld our rent twice already. And if I uh, read the list of the things that need to be taken care of in our building, I wouldn't finish tonight. Por favor, yo les pido que intervengan. Yo soy una madre inmigrante que vine buscando un sueño, pero ese sueño va muy lejos de lo que yo pensaba. I really beg you that you intervene. I'm an immigrant mother. I came here with dreams, but that dream is really far now. Por favor, necesitamos que, rente, que la renta esté frisada. Necesitamos que nuestros hijos tengan una buena educación. Necesitamos que nuestros hijos no, no pasen lo que nosotros pasamos. Como yo, que tengo dos hijos, que cuando me dicen que le hagan un quick pay, no puedo hacer un quick pay porque no tengo porque tengo que pagar mi renta. Un quick pay es porque están en la universidad. Entonces de aquí yo tengo que mandarle a ellos. Pero yo tengo que tener mi renta para cuando ellos vuelvan. Okay. Um, so I, I ask you to please do something about the situation and please um, uh, implement a rent freeze. I want my children to have a good education. I don't want them to be in the same situation that I'm in. I have two children in university and sometimes they ask me to do like a quick pay to send money, but I can't do that because I need to have money in the bank in order to pay for my rent. Gracias. Yo sé que sí se puede. Gracias por su entusiasmo. Thank you, and I know that we can do this. Thank you for your time and your enthusiasm. Thank you. Jules Hollander. Good evening. Thank Good you evening. for coming to testify. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening. Um, my name is Jules Hollander. I am a music teacher here in Harlem uh, and have been living here for the past four years uh, with my wife in a rent stabilized apartment. Um, she's been living there uh, since her childhood. Um, and so I've tried, you know, to be a diligent gentrifier and be active in my um, uh, tenants association. And um, I've experienced a lot of um, or witnessing a lot of things um, that have come to my attention. Um, this is the second time that I've come to this gathering here. I came here last year, I believe. Um, and, you know, something that has struck me are the repetitive um, demands by people here, um, and somehow it feels like it's falling on deaf ears. How many times do we have to get together to demand a rent freeze? How often do native New Yorkers have to demand the ability to live where they've always lived and not be pushed out of their neighborhoods? How many statistics and testimonies do you have to listen to about unfair treatment and neglect of tenants by landlords 
for the Rent Guidelines Bureau to demand, or Bureau to demand an indeterminate rent freeze until a solution is figured out so that Native New Yorkers can live in safety and in dignity. When rents have increased at exorbitant rates that outmatch increase in pay, this is a deliberate attack, not just on Native New Yorkers, but on the poor and minority communities. Especially when considering how the Trump administration's tax plans on un, uh, places an unfair burden on the middle and working class, by not allowing for a rent freeze, you will be giving, um, you will be gutting New York City of its soul, of its native communities, and leaving it a shell of its former self and a playground for the rich. Thank you. Thank you. The next speakers are Bernshi Jones and Luis Aguis. Hi, my name Good is Bernshi Jones. I am a singer. Um, I'm a native New Yorker. I grew up here. And I have many of the same complaints. What comes to mind primarily is inflation. We are not getting wage increases. There isn't enough money coming in and other sources of income for us to afford to pay rent increase. The other thing I think of is quality of life. Every time we have an apartment converted, we get thinner walls, we get less quality, we get shoddy repair people, we have one painter, when I, and I lived in my apartment for 40 years. We, when I needed a paint job, there'd be two, three guys come out. Now it's one guy taking a whole week. I have a five and a half room apartment, so it's quite large. The other thing is people are constantly being challenged in court and don't have money to fight the landlord's attorneys. And sometimes those, those charges are bogus, but we need to pay the money to win in court. Okay, that's, that's another thing that is a real problem. Um, gosh, um, of course I'm not remembering everything right now, but I'm here, I'm basically on disability, so I have a rent freeze. The other thing I was gonna talk about is that the. I live in a 75 apartment building in Morningside Heights. Now most of the renters are market renters. We are finding it impossible to organize because the market renters are afraid that the landlord will not renew their leases. We have very few numbers with rent stabilized tenants and many of those people are feeling intimidated and we have, no, very often we have no heat no hot water, brown water, my windows don't lock, I can't close them, they, they actually are off the springs. None of these repairs are being responded to in any meaningful way. If I would have to go to court, and this is becoming a problem with organizing, we're finding that people are not able to organize, so it's not fair to say, okay, well look, if you don't like it, you can move, where? If you don't like it, you have resources to take landlords to court. Not when most of your tenants are market renters and they're afraid to make any noise. This is a problem. And even those market renters are paying for no services. I'm in Morningside Heights. It's a very nice area. It used to be. So someone mentioned earlier, okay, we're not getting the services. Also, landlords have been making record number of profits and for years, and have done so even in the hardest hit economic years, landlords have profited. Thank you very much. Thank you. Luis Aguis? He needs a, an interpreter, please? Yes. Would you prefer to, uh, well, let's find out. Could you ask him if he prefers to sit down?
Sí. Sí. Good evening. Thank you for coming to testify. Good evening, panel. Mi nombre es Luis Aguas. Estoy pasando penalidades, como testificó una miembro de la Asociación de Inquilinos. Soy miembro o líder de la Asociación de Inquilinos por 30 años. Por 30 años hemos tenido dos huelgas que hemos ganado por pasar las penalidades que estamos pasando hoy. Pero Luis Aguas ha caído en crisis de, de cáncer en el estómago, que me han dado seis meses de vida. Pero porque yo estoy con cáncer, yo no voy a dejar que el pueblo o mis inquilinos también caigan en cáncer, como está el edificio. Deje que ella traduzca. Sí, ya. Um, hello, my, no my name is Luis Aguilar, and I'm, disculpe, Aguas. Um, and I'm a leader at the Tenant Association, and I've been in that Tenant Association for 30 years. And twice, as my other uh, compañera had said, who's in the Tenant Association, we have withheld our rent. And we are in a crisis right now. And I actually, I have cancer, um, but I'm not going to allow my other uh, tenants to also experience this and get cancer themselves due to what's happening. Ahora, por primera vez, que estoy testificando ante un panel, a ver si ustedes hacen algo, no por el Luis Aguas que está con cáncer, sino por el, los dos edificios que yo estoy corriendo como líder. Y no quiero que sufran lo que yo estoy sufriendo. ¿A dónde van a vivir? ¿A dónde van a ir nuestros hijos, nuestros nietos, los de la comunidad? Por eso yo he luchado y estoy luchando hasta el último, vida de, hasta el último día de mi vida. So I am here, I am here fighting for all these buildings. I'm not, I don't want you to do this for Luis Aguas. I want you to do this for all the tenants that are in these buildings. We don't want people to suffer. I don't want them to suffer like me. Where are the children and the, our grandchildren and all the people that live here, where are they gonna go? I'm gonna continue fighting till my last day. Ahora, ¿qué será de ustedes? ¿Quiénes van a decir si tengo o no razón? de pedir, no por mí, porque yo ya no valgo nada, pero sí los que se quedan atrás mío, sí las generaciones, como extranjeros, como inmigrantes, les pido de favor, hagan algo por esta vez que está en crisis el líder y el edificio, los dos edificios que yo estoy corriendo. Allá hace poco teníamos una comunicación con el Arlandores, pero que supieron um, so I ask you, what are you going to decide to do? What are you going to say? What are you going to do? And what are you going to do for the, you know, for this crisis that's happening right now? There's immigrants and there's different people that are in these buildings. And uh, we're going through a crisis right now. The two buildings that I represent are going through crisis. Ahora, desde que supieron que yo estoy en, con cáncer, ya los, los landlords ya no quieren saber nada porque saben que ya yo no voy a poder tener la palabra para dirigir como he dirigido durante los 30 años. Yo no quiero eso, yo quiero que ustedes salven esta crisis que estamos pasando. El, el edificio está con cáncer, eso quiere decir que está en malas condiciones, inhabitables, inhibibles. Hay otro edificio del mismo que no tiene gas y todo el edificio. Lo mismo, parte de mis miembros tampoco tienen gas por más de 10 meses. Hagan algo, por favor, no por mí, sino por aquellos que están necesitados vivir aquí en, este, en esta comunidad, vivir aquí en Nueva York, que no nos saquen a vivir en los parques ni en los puentes. No, no, no merecemos eso. Yo ya no pierdo nada, como les repito. 85 años de vivir, 40 años de trabajar a sol y sombra, pero ya está suficiente, por favor. Por favor, pongan a ver si pueden frisar por lo menos un tiempito más hasta cuando líder Luis Aguas 
esté sobreviviendo. Pero yo viviré para el pueblo, porque soy pueblo, porque soy inmigrante, inmigrantes también. No quiero que los líderes, no quiero que mi generación siga pasando lo que yo estoy pasando. Gracias y que Dios los bendiga. Príncipe, nada más les pido. Gracias, paneles. Um, so, I really feel that these buildings are experiencing, experiencing a type of cancer because of everything that's happening inside of them. I continue to be a leader here, and I've been a leader for 30 years, and I want you to save us. I want you to save these buildings. I want people to continue to inhabit these buildings. Um, there's, uh, in our buildings, there's people that don't have gas, and they haven't had gas for about 10 months, and you need to do something about this. Do it for me and do it for other people. And I've been, um, I've been, I've been with these buildings and I've been supporting this work. I, um, I am 85 years old and I've been working for 40 years. I've been working from day and night. Um, and I've also been in this struggle for, and I've been a leader here for 30 years as well in my, in my building. And do this, do this for immigrants, do, these for, do this for all other generations. And I hope that you get to, that I hope that you decide to do a rent freeze while I'm still alive. I want to see that happen. Como último le pido. Thank you. Ahora en la mañana me sacaron el monitor que tengo por el cáncer. Y para venir acá me quitaron el, el monitor del cáncer, del, de la quimioterapia, pero no querían que yo viniera para acá. Pero es muy importante que yo esté, la voz del pueblo, la voz de todos ustedes también, que tal vez pagarán renta o no pagarán. Los que pagamos un dólar, o mil dólares, o un millón, tenemos los mismos derechos. Gracias y disculpen. Thank you. So this morning, uh, my monitor was removed uh, for my chemo because I wanted to come here because it was really important for me to come here and give my testimony. They didn't want me to come, but I asked them, that I told them that this was really important. And I'm here to be the voice of the people. And it doesn't matter if we pay one dollar, one thousand, or a million for our rent. Uh, and maybe some of you all are renters, but we do need this right now. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes, and that concludes the testimony. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming out to give testimony this evening. We very much appreciate it. Um, do I have a motion to adjourn? I second. Second? All right, we, we are adjourned. Thank you all very much. Con eso concluimos el evento para esta noche. Muchas gracias por haber venido. Buenas noches.